Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers um, for inviting me to this beautiful country with its long and rich history, and also for hosting this uh, very important event and inviting me to um, talk on responsible gambling and the public health. So as I do with all of my talks these days, I have a listing of relationships with the pharmaceutical, uh, gambling, and legal uh, entities. I thought I'd start by uh, talking about what is gambling. And so one definition of gambling is that it's placing something of value at risk in the hopes of gaining something of greater value. So in some ways, this should be a relatively straightforward uh, description about what constitutes gambling and what doesn't constitute gambling um, remains debated, as, for example, in the case of loot boxes or in the case of daily fantasy sports. So I've argued in the past that this perception of gambling may be influenced by the relative amount of risk and reward associated uh, with the behavior, as one can see in stock market uh, behaviors. Um, but with respect to traditional forms of gambling, most adults around the uh, globe, in, in most jurisdictions at least, uh, gamble and do so without developing problems. Um, but I would also argue that um, at a public health level, it's important to consider the entire range of gambling behaviors. And so um, we've argued that gambling can be um, seen along a spectrum from non-gambling to uh, disordered gambling, um, and that there are many factors at the individual and social and societal level uh, that may influence uh, the level of gambling behavior as well as transitions between these levels. So when is gambling a problem? Uh, this has also been debated. Um, if the gambling behaviors lie along a spectrum, how do we separate problematic from non-problematic uh, gambling? Um, however, several of the psychiatric nomenclature systems, for example, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and the International Classification of Diseases, um, have defined criteria for conditions relating to problematic gambling. And so these are the current editions or the forthcoming edition of the DSM and the ICD. And in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, the term pathological gambling was introduced in 1980. There were changes made um, in the 80s and 90s with respect to the inclusionary criteria. Uh, it was defined as an impulse control disorder. And they're going uh, from DSM-4 to DSM-5 in 2013, there were additional changes in the criteria for the disorder, uh, the thresholding, um, how many criteria are needed to meet uh, a disorder, and then um, how the disorder was classified. And this uh, information uh, about the reclassification was based on uh, data that had accumulated over the course of uh, decades. And why does classification matter? I think that it's very important. Um, for example, in uh, France, the government requires addiction treatment centers to provide care for people with ad behavioral addictions. So if gambling disorder is classified as a behavioral addiction, as it is now in DSM-5, uh, this has direct clinical implications. So ICD-11 um, was being generated over the past several years, and there were questions that existed with respect to whether uh, the ICD-11 would um, harmonize with the DSM-5. And so I was involved in um, multiple World Health Organization work groups that considered internet use behaviors uh, and behavioral addictions, including uh, gambling. And as we've heard about earlier today, uh, the technology, digital technologies in the internet have changed many behaviors, including gambling. Um, the World Health Assembly adopted the ICD-11 uh, earlier this year, in May 2019, and they followed uh, the, um, the DSM-5 in some ways, but differed from the DSM-5 in other ways. So gambling disorder uh, was the diagnostic entity that was adopted, changing from pathological gambling, uh, like in the DSM. And this was done because it was felt that the term pathological um, uh, was a barrier for people seeking help. 
And it's estimated that about 10% of people with a gambling disorder uh, ever seek treatment for uh, their gambling problems. Uh, importantly, gambling disorder was classified as a disorder due to uh, addictive behaviors. And so this follows the reclassification of gambling disorder in the DSM-5 as a behavioral addiction. One thing that was different uh, in the ICD-11 as compared to the DSM-5 was that there were specifiers for the behavior being done predominantly offline or predominantly online. And I think this speaks to uh, the changes uh, that are occurring with respect to uh, gambling behaviors and other behaviors on the internet. So what are some of the, the changes? Um, over the past decade or so, there has been a tripling of the um, internet gambling market. And there are uh, data to suggest that the risk factors for individuals um, developing problems with internet gambling may be different from those, who, uh, those risk factors that are associated with um, offline gambling. Uh, so, for example, in uh, Connecticut high school students, we found that uh, there's less of a link uh, with peer or um, other um, friends, family members gambling, linking at-risk problem gambling um, uh, behaviors amongst the uh, internet gambling group. I would also argue that um, uh, particular forms of gambling may be particularly risky on the internet. So um, live action or during uh, the sporting event types of gambling appear to be uh, highly risky for individuals. And so this raises questions about uh, the role of the media. So for example, in this, this setting of uh, deregulation, if you will, in the United States on sports gambling, uh, with the Supreme Court overturning the uh, Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, uh, more states are legalizing sports gambling. Uh, the media, for example, ESPN, is showing programs that focus on uh, wagering, and that some of the uh, gray areas, if you will, of sports gambling, uh, daily fantasy sports, are now becoming engaged in uh, sports gambling. So I would also argue that gambling and gaming are converging behaviors. Um, and this can be seen with respect to not only daily fantasy sports, but loot boxes and loot crates in different jurisdictions thinking about um, whether these are gambling or not. Uh, social casino games, which may not involve placing monetary bets, but do teach um, individuals, and particularly I think we should be mindful of teaching children about the, the rules of, if you will, of casino gambling, um, may uh, be uh, particularly uh, concerning, particularly if there are microtransactions where people need to pay money over time to continue or go to higher levels as these have been linked to youth developing uh, gambling problems. And this continues um, with respect to integrating casino gambling into video games, like in uh, Grand Theft Auto. Uh, there was a, a recent introduction um, of casino gambling there, and this has been debated uh, across the Twitter sphere uh, with respect to uh, how this should be regulated. So what were the uh, criteria for gambling disorder in ICD-11? I've highlighted in orange the um, key elements, persistent or recurring gambling behavior, we, that uh, there is impaired control over the gambling, the gambling takes increasing priority such that it takes precedence over other life interests and activities, and there's the continuation of the gambling despite the occurrence of negative consequences. And all three of those criteria need to be met in addition to significant impairment in one or other, um, one or more uh, areas of functioning. There is also a, a time period of at least 12 months, although this can be reduced if there is a rapid progression. I think importantly from a public health perspective, and this differs from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, there are criteria for hazardous gambling or betting that have been introduced. And hazardous gambling or betting um, is a type of risky gambling that does not meet the criteria for gambling disorder. 
So the gambling or betting appreciably increases the risk of harmful physical or mental health consequences, and this may be related to the frequency, amount of time from neglecting other activities or priorities, or for other risky behaviors associated with the gambling uh, and betting. But it does not reach the level of a, a gambling disorder. And I think by having defined criteria for this hazardous gambling, as exists, for example, with respect to hazardous alcohol use, uh, this will help um, uh, public health officials um, uh, promote public health behaviors with respect to gambling. So we, we heard a bit about uh, vulnerable populations, and I would argue that um, there are specific vulnerable populations with respect to uh, problem gambling and gambling disorder. Uh, these are data from the National Comorbidity Replication Survey, and one can see if one looks at the prevalence estimates, um, there are high rates of um, psychiatric disorders in individuals with gambling disorder. It's estimated that 96% of individuals with gambling disorder have one or more co-occurring psychiatric disorder from this study, and uh, close to two-thirds have three or more psychiatric disorders. So mental health or mental illness is a, a risk factor for uh, gambling problems. So it raises the question of how can different groups work together? And we've heard a bit about bringing together different uh, stakeholders. And these can be uh, industry, advocacy, governmental, academic research uh, groups. Um, and in, in the United States, I've been involved uh, with a, an American Gaming Association-led initiative um, called the Responsible Gaming Collaborative. And that's involved in a number of different groups, including advocacy groups like the National Council on uh, Problem Gambling, uh, academia, um, uh, Yale and Harvard and other uh, groups, as well as uh, industry representatives to try to promote um, problem gambling and to look at the data and how we can uh, work together to uh, promote responsible gambling efforts. Uh, but I would also uh, caution about the, the term uh, gaming versus gambling. Um, and I would advocate for the use of uh, gambling as, uh, particularly as younger individuals mature, uh, they have a very different view of what is gaming and what is gambling. And gaming is now, uh, gaming disorder is an official diagnosis in the ICD-11 uh, that focuses on video game. So I think it's going to be important to keep, the, the bound, keep in mind the boundaries between uh, gaming and gambling. Um, and how do we promote um, responsible gambling efforts? Uh, one program that is being incorporated into lottery in our state and in our region into casino gambling is GameSense. But I would also urge that one um, tests these interventions to determine whether they are having the desired effect or not. So how can we enact policy changes that help promote responsible uh, gambling? There are multiple ways. One is with respect to advocacy. And I'll bring up uh, an example that the National Council uh, on uh, Problem Gambling uh, promoted. Uh, and this um, constitutes a, a many years effort to try to uh, change the laws. Uh, Keith White and uh, colleagues uh, organized and participated in a uh, Capitol Hill Advocacy Day uh, last year. And this is to try to um, promote, uh, and promote responsible gambling and protect military uh, personnel from developing uh, gambling problems and receiving help when they do. And this involved bringing in veterans to uh, Congress uh, and having them talk about their experiences. A number of us went to our um, representatives uh, on Capitol Hill to um, try to advocate for people with problem gambling. And this led to a bill being brought um, to the Congress and being endorsed by uh, the House and the Senate in the United States, and ultimately a bill being signed into law. Uh, but it then raises the question of whether the law will be enacted, and that's the stage that we're at right now, so um, it still takes ongoing effort. And what are some of the ways where we can 
uh, provide support for advocacy. And I would say that there is an important role for, for data. And in, in our country, I would argue that the structure of doing research in gambling is uh, hampered. Uh, so, for example, we have uh, National Institutes of Health that promotes and funds research in multiple areas, uh, but for behavioral addictions, including gambling disorder, there isn't a, a good institute to support this. There is a National Institute on Drug Abuse that focuses on drug use problems, a National Institute on Alcohol Abuse on Alcoholism that focuses on alcohol use problems, and one on, national, uh, on mental health that focuses on mental health and that agency does not consider addictions within their jurisdiction. So in many ways, uh, gambling disorder and gaming disorder and other behavioral addictions uh, do not have an appropriate home. Um, and this occurs in the setting of uh, the government receiving uh, substantial funds uh, from gambling, uh, but not uh, supporting uh, gambling uh, treatment uh, or research. So gambling treatment receives about 23 cents per person um, as compared, and so $73 million total, uh, as compared to the over uh, close to a quarter of a billion, uh, uh, close to $25 billion um, in funding that's given for substance use disorder uh, treatment. And again, this occurs in the setting of the states receiving about uh, close to $28 billion uh, in gambling-related uh, revenues. So I think that um, while there is this need for, from the public health and personal health perspective for additional research um, that, and this falls uh, in a greater uh, domain of not only gambling disorder, but gaming disorder and other behavioral addictions, uh, our country um, is not well-structured um, to support that research and hope that we can uh, change that in our country, but would encourage um, Cyprus to be thinking about how to support um, such efforts here. So um, I would argue that the public health and policy efforts relating to preventing problem gambling and promoting responsible gambling should consider a broad range of uh, problem gambling severity levels. I focused on uh, the individuals with gambling disorder, uh, but from a public health perspective, those who um, have uh, subdiagnostic levels of gambling constitute a larger proportion of the population and warrant important consideration that multiple stakeholders should be involved, and that uh, the collection of data in order to understand what are the empirically supported or evidence-based interventions is very important. So I'd like to thank a large number of individuals, uh, funding agencies, and like to thank you all for your attention. <laughs>